there's a lot of uncertainty about what the rest of 2020 has in store for the world. In this video, we discuss the best and worst case scenarios based on the most up-to-date information. Let's get to it. An ongoing pandemic, economic crisis, geopolitical tensions, civil unrest, and biblical climate extremes are but some of the games that are going to get decided this year. The best case scenario is that the virus goes away or is medicated away in some capacity. The Federal Reserve and its quantitative easing strategy kicks our economic woes down the road even more. The elections are decided peacefully and democratically. China and the United States find a peaceful resolution. The industrial slowdown over the past four months in part restores the ecological balance of the world and ushers in a new era of environmentally friendly capitalism. And the worst is in the rearview mirror. That's the best case scenario. Now the worst case scenario requires a bit more elaboration. So let's get to it. According to the most up-to-date job reports, at the time of this video, there could be potentially up to 50 million people unemployed come June 1st, with only 50% of those jobs expected to return. In Canada, this number is proportionally less, but still ranging between 2 to 3 million people. With more people out of work, the less money they have to spend, and this causes the velocity of money to slow down and economic contraction which may lead to further job loss. This chart that demonstrates the economic aftermath of the 1929 stock market crash shows that it took several years to reach peak unemployment and this was the result of this vicious cycle unfolding. Now at the same time the stock market continues to rise. This means that the 600 billionaires in the USA see their profits go up $400 billion so far throughout this pandemic. And this is why we are likely to see a resurgence of Occupy movements and Tea Party movements, one arguing for better wages, safer working conditions, and a redistribution of wealth, and another arguing for reduced taxes which are bound to go up to pay for all of this federal stimulus. This level of civil unrest is likely to have repercussions within the stock market and eventually it will crash. Companies will go bankrupt which will lead to further unemployment, less consumer spending, more bankruptcies, more foreclosures and a downward deflationary debt spiral. Followed by hyperinflation when the Fed's balance sheet is realized in the markets and countries start abandoning the US dollar. In addition to this, there is a potential for a looming mortgage crisis. In spite of the Federal Reserve's many interventions to stabilize the financial markets, there has been very little attention paid towards the housing market. This, of course, is a catch-22 situation because if the Federal Reserve prints more money and puts more stuff on its balance sheet, that is a greater burden for the taxpayer. If it doesn't, however, the US mortgage finance system could potentially collapse due to the coming wave of missed payments by borrowers who are crippled by this pandemic. If the mortgage finance system collapses, it's going to be harder for people to get credit to mortgage homes in the future. This will have all types of negative repercussions in the real estate market. Now, some people will say that's a good thing and we should just let capitalism run its course. Others indicate that a crisis of that magnitude would have too much of a destabilizing effect on society as a whole, and that it's better to bail out the system and kick the can down the road for a few more years at least. And although many banks are offering mortgage forbearance to their borrowers, some of these people are not going to be able to return to work. Thus, mortgage providers may be dealing with millions of potential foreclosures in the next six months. And of course, with all of these foreclosures, that's going to flood the market with real estate and property prices are going to significantly deflate which by some people's standards, and if you have money to invest, is of course a good thing. But for most people who hold those mortgages, or who are invested in these mortgage-backed securities, it's going to be a very, very bad decade. The same holds true for commercial real estate. With many businesses not bringing in any money, they can't pay their rents. And it's projected that up to 25% of small businesses are not going to be reopened. This of course is not a problem which is limited to the United States and Canada. Countries the world over have no choice but to move into austerity 
and are at risk of becoming destabilized. Just like how the Great Recession in 2008 triggered food riots around the world and led to the destabilization of many countries, the current crisis is a much sharper decline and it's far more global in its scope due to the reach of this pandemic. We may see a short-term deflationary debt spiral, meaning that the demand for consumer products will fall below the supply. Therefore, in the short term, prices will deflate. But as the Federal Reserve's forecast $10 trillion worth of quantitative easing liquefies throughout the economy, the US dollar will become inflated and potentially be abandoned by some countries who lose faith in the integrity of the dollar, if a better option presents itself. In this scenario, the price of precious metals and cryptocurrencies will skyrocket. There is a worst case scenario prediction that this crisis could cost the global economy $82 trillion over the next five years. And of course, it will be the poor and the middle class people of the world who have to bear the brunt of this devaluation. This is going to breed a lot of resentment for the billionaire class who is largely unfazed and in many cases benefited from this crisis. This will lead to protests, riots, and civil unrest on a global scale never before seen. I would predict that if it did get this bad, we may for the first time see international general strikes. We may for the first time see an international Occupy movement or even an international Tea Party movement that will resist the increased taxation and austerity measures which are brought in after this. But time will tell if I'm right about that. Because remember, it's not only the US government that is running a deficit this year. The world is in economic contraction. Many of the nations of the world which are already indebted up to their necks are going to be running massive deficits and doing their own brand of quantitative easing. This crisis may unite the poor and middle class on a global scale, the likes of which has never before been seen. And now of course there is technology to facilitate this. The end result of this will be massive calls for universal basic income in the truest, most universal sense of the word. I'm going to post six YouTube channels in the description section of this video. Three of these channels frequently make a bear case for the market. These three channels are very pessimistic about the market. They believe that the stock market is going to crash once again and possibly even culminating into a collapse of the US dollar. I'll also post three links to channels that have more optimistic views of what may be coming down the road. It's important that you have a balanced perspective and not just focus on the potential negative outcomes, because if you only fixate on that, you won't see all of the opportunities that might present themselves in these conditions. Remember that all good crops start off with really good fertilizer. And the best type of fertilizer is manure. And we're going to have a whole lot of that this year. Now, according to the CDC, the worst case scenario for COVID deaths may be over 1 million Americans that fall victim to this illness. The most likely projection at this point is around 500,000 fatalities. Currently, we sit at 100,000. This is, of course, factoring in the second wave. The worst case scenario, of course, is hard to predict because the virus could mutate within a second and third wave. Recall that the second wave of the 1918 Spanish flu was an order of magnitude more severe than the first wave. If this were to happen and the nation were to go into some form of lockdown once again, whether federally mandated or volunteer based, meaning that there was no directive from the government for people to stay home, but that people stayed home because they were too scared of catching the disease, this would double down on the financial crisis and make all of the things I just talked about even worse. More jobs would be lost, more homes would be lost, and there would be more civil unrest. Supply chains would be further compromised as they are now, leading to higher food prices. In many places like Canada, food prices are expected to rise across the board. In developed nations, food price increases aren't going to be as catastrophic as they will be in developing nations. We've seen what happens in countries like Venezuela, Egypt, Lebanon, in any country which was impacted by the Arab Spring. The people with nothing to lose absolutely lose it. Governments will fall and it will have negative ripple effects throughout the global economy. Now, political unrest may be similar to what we've seen in 2016 in the United States, where disputes between the populist movements of the right and left 
and of course the moderate right and left start to heat up and peak towards the end of the year. The differences of opinion between right and left in terms of how to deal with the COVID situation have polarized these two wings of the political spectrum, possibly even more than they were in 2016, and that's saying a lot. I would not be surprised that with so many people out of work that we start seeing clashes between far right and far left groups once again. One of the biggest wild cards is the tensions between the US and China. We are in a transitional period in the world where China starts to emerge as the world's superpower, as the United States declines in its sphere of influence. This divide between the US and China is going to be exacerbated by the US political situation this year when the Trump campaign is going to push for isolationism, noting the significant supply chain disruptions in the wake of the pandemic, and the left will likely continue to promote globalization and a lowering of trade barriers. Now we've seen rhetoric of course from both sides with the United States blaming China for the outbreak, even claiming that it may have originated in a lab. And of course some factions of the Chinese government have even claimed that the virus was brought over by the United States. And there are some big threats being made by both sides. Some Republican lawmakers have even proposed cancelling the $1 trillion of US debt that is held by China. This of course would be considered an act of war and would quickly move us into a Cold War scenario. Now the likelihood of that happening is low, but if the worst case scenario happens and that happens, then indeed we may be at the crossroads of a new Cold War. There's many geopolitical entanglements with China, whether that be in Taiwan or Hong Kong, or even its increasing military cooperation with Iran and different African nations, as well as the many European countries that it now has ties with as a result of the Belt and Road Initiative, which was a strategy started in 2013 in which China really started to broaden its sphere of influence in building economic ties with other countries. This puts many European countries who are in the NATO alliance, whose economies would be crippled, at least in the short term, if they responded to US pressure and decoupled themselves from the Chinese economy. And of course, with China being the rising superpower of the world, being in the crossfire of the United States and China, they will have the existential task of choosing sides. Right now, the relationship between the US and China is at a historic low. A worst case scenario would see this quickly devolve into a Cold War like situation. It doesn't help that 60% of Americans now hold negative views about the Chinese government. And there's a high probability that the reverse is true with many Chinese citizens being convinced that the United States is to blame, whether the result of propaganda or otherwise. Now the one thing which will make this a distinctly different situation than was had between the Soviet Union and the United States is that unlike that situation, China and the United States are joined at the hip when it comes to international trade. It's very unlikely, at least in the short term, that a decoupling of these economies could actually ensue. On the surface, it seems like the economic entanglements between these two nations are simply too vast that things could devolve so quickly. Then again, it's arguable that in light of this pandemic, the people have now acclimated to these abrupt socioeconomic shifts. And while these economies still are very interlinked, people have already been primed with these supply chain disruptions now. And should a worst case scenario in which all ties between China and the United States are actually severed, people would be more likely to acquiesce to these larger supply chain disruptions that would ensue as a result of already being conditioned to it for the first half of 2020. The short of it is, there has been so much crisis and turmoil this year, if a spat between China and the USA erupted, people would probably just think to themselves, well, just another day in 2020. Whereas last year, such a thing would be unfathomable. But you can bet that the geopolitical tensions which find the United States in support of Taiwan and Hong Kong and the sanctioning of Chinese technology companies like Huawei, the withdrawing of financial support to the World Health Organization, and even legislations which have been passed which is going to bar certain Chinese companies from being listed on US stock exchanges, and complement that with the increasing militarization of the Chinese 
this may be the beginning of the decoupling of these two empires and a movement towards all-out global conflict. So to summarize then, the worst case scenario for 2020 for North America is an economic depression, a collapse of the US dollar, the beginning of a cold war with China, civil unrest that culminates into protests and riots and even global movements, increases in Amerocentrism and Sinocentrism, both countries becoming more nationalistic, a pandemic that gets worse, and quite possibly a postponement of the elections if all of this stuff gets out of hand. We would see a mortgage crisis, food shortages, and a situation that falls just short of a Mad Max scenario. Now this is not the most likely scenario. This could still go in many different directions. There is a more optimistic view, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Let me know what your worst case and best case scenario is for 2020 in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com, your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER, all one word in all caps.